safety and ambulance operations. At the completion of this course, you guys are going to be all expert drivers. So I was a professional driver driving semis for over two years. I learned a lot about driving. Never once had an accident, thankfully. And I saw a lot of bad drivers and I learned a lot about how traffic happens and what you can do to prevent traffic and also what you can do to prevent road rage, okay? Because road rage happens to all of us. I know it happens to you guys because it happens to me. It happens to pretty much everybody. You can have the nicest person in the world, but you get them behind two tons of steel and they have a layer, a level of anonymity and protection and they can turn into complete jerks. It happens. How do you manage this the best? Honestly, the best piece of advice I can give you guys for driving is this. Leave enough space between you and the vehicle in front of you. Always. Leave enough space so someone could comfortably pull in there if they needed to. Leave enough space so that if they hit their brakes, you'll have time to react and slow down without slamming on your brakes. It pays to have a nice following distance between you and the ambulance or you and the vehicle in front of you. Realistically, if everybody did that, we wouldn't have traffic because all traffic comes from improper lane merges. I'm sure you guys have noticed this. You get stuck in rush hour. Where does it get worst? On the on-ramps and off-ramps, people merging in and out too late, too early, trying to do these things that are damaging to traffic overall. If everybody let people merge in, we wouldn't have traffic, really. But that's not the way we drive. But you can help yourself by just giving a little more space between you and the vehicle in front of you. We will never make up time by driving fast in the ambulances, all right? We will only make up time by driving carefully and driving smart. Here's the different types of ambulances. I don't know why we still insist on teaching you guys this type, but we do. <clears throat> These are the original ambulances. EMS is a fairly new service. This is what they used to use back in the 60s and 70s when we were first getting a footing EMS was a very different ball game back then. There's some pretty high tech stuff here too. And finally flight. <clears throat> I personally don't like helicopters. Not, I shouldn't say I don't like helicopters. I wouldn't be a flight medic. Part of that is because I'm, I'm too tall. I think realistically I'm, I'm too tall to be a flight medic. And let's be honest, helicopters can't carry that much weight. So it, makes more sense for them to hire small, smaller medics or, or female medics because they just weigh less, they take up less space, and that way you can carry heavier patients and you can fly further. It would make sense if all they only hired small women to work in their, ambulance, or in their uh, helicopters. That being said, I did know one flight medic was six foot four and weighed like 200 pounds, and he was great at it. But... <clears throat> can't fly all year round. All right, skipping over ambulance and safe operation laws. Unfortunately, the, the good thing about ambulances are physics are going to be on your side if you're, in an if you're in an accident. Ambulances are big, powerful vehicles. They are very thoroughly and solidly built. This is why we're driving them into the ground with 400, 500,000 miles on them frequently at AMR. Well, or sorry, at any private transport company that we're working for. Let's just put it that way. The bad news is we're often unrestrained. And there's lots of stuff in the back that can go flying around. Your life pack, how much does that thing weigh? 30 pounds? That thing, it will become a missile if you get into an accident. How often are you, are you driving around with that restraint? Even if, you're, if you have your seatbelt on, do you have your life pack with a seatbelt on it to keep it from becoming a, uh, a flying object? Not always. Over 40% of accidents in ambulances occur at intersections. This should make sense, right? Especially if you're coming up to red lights. Um, it's happened to me before. People, it doesn't matter how loud and bright you are, I've not the accidents happened to me, but all, a near accident at intersections, people just blasting through. They, they're, you know, they play their music loud. You don't really see or hear an ambulance until you're right on top of it or it's right on top of you. So just be careful. Look, there's never a good reason to just blast through a red light. Okay, obviously that just makes sense. Even at green lights, you should be looking.
<clears throat> also lose control. This is a picture of, unfortunately, a fatal accident involving an ambulance. The people in the ambulance were not killed. All three drivers in the other vehicle were killed. What laws do we have to follow? The same laws as anybody else. Laws still apply to us. We are, when we're driving code three with lights and sirens, able to bend certain laws and break other ones in the name of safety. But we can still get citations for this if someone, cop, believes that we're not doing things safely. I've, I've never seen it. I've never heard of anyone getting an, a ticket in an ambulance, but I've heard friends of friends say that it has happened. I can't confirm it myself. <clears throat> Anyways, lots of things can cause potential problems in these ambulances and crashes. Due regard, great. Never assume that you have the right of way. All right, we always need to assume that other drivers are going to do the stupidest possible thing, right? And if you drive like that, you'll drive smarter and you'll drive more cautiously and you'll be less likely to get in an accident. The reason motorcycle drive, motorcycles, motorcyclists are less likely to get in an accident is because they have a better range of view than the average driver. They're also more situationally aware of what's going on around them. Motorcyclists get in accidents much less frequently than average drivers compared to how many of them there are on the road. The problem with motorcycles is if you do get in an accident, it's going to be a lot more severe because you're not encased in steel. Even a low speed impact or a low speed accident or even just laying down the bike at 20 miles an hour can be disastrous for you if you're not wearing the right safety gear or if you do it in the wrong place. I've seen people lay down their bikes going 25 miles an hour on a back roads and, and just end up getting their legs almost completely amputated. Not amputated, but uh, like traumatically just ground down away, flops, avulsions, completely smashed and broken. We had a guy he uh, it wasn't on a, on a back street, but he was probably going about 40, 45. He had to lay his bike down. He was wearing shorts and flip-flops. His leg was hanging on by a couple tendons. And I remember we're looking at his leg and the tendons were kind of stretched out there. And I remember having this thought that I just wanted to reach out my finger and just pluck his tendon like a little guitar string and see what note it would make. I didn't, but I can't help but that that thought cropped up into my mind. And every time I think about it, I still think about playing his... Uh, his leg banjo there. <clears throat> Warning devices. Other drivers aren't gonna see or hear you, no matter how loud and fancy and, and bright red or yellow you are. People just are not going to be paying attention. A lot of our accidents are gonna happen at intersections. We talked about that. You must take controlled stop at all intersections to make eye contact with the drivers before entering the intersection. Yeah, that's as much as you can. Escorts can be helpful. Sometimes if you're in an ambulance following a fire truck, that's great. But people need to understand that they don't always know that there's gonna be two things coming, right? That fire trucks are really big, they're louder, they have air horns because they have air brakes. Your ambulances don't have air horns because they don't have air brakes. They have electronic horns that sound like air horns. If you've ever heard a true air horn, AKA a semi on the highway and you ask him to blow his horn, he goes, boom, boom, that's the air horn. Those are loud, okay? They're using compressed air to make that sound. The reason the fire trucks and the trucks on the highway do that is because they use air brakes. Those are very powerful brakes to lock that vehicle in place when it's parked so that it will not move. It will not move, okay? You need to pump air into those brakes. It takes a little while to get air in those brakes so you can even get them moving when you start up the vehicles. So they have air reserves. That's why they do that. Environmental concerns. Weather can be very damaging. Now our ambulances are heavy, so we are less likely to, to go um, to slide on the roads, all right? Realistically, you're more likely to hydroplane in a car or a lightweight vehicle than you are in a heavy vehicle. The heavier you are, the more firmly you sit on the ground. It's just physics. Ambulances are very heavy. Fire trucks are very heavy. They're less likely to hydroplane. It can still happen. It's what's more of a consideration is black ice. If you're living somewhere, I don't know, like Detroit, 
when I was a trucker, I, I'm from Tucson, Arizona. Okay. It gets 115 here in the summer, but it's a dry heat. You go in the shade, you get a mister and it's 70 degrees and you're wonderful. In the winter, it gets really cold. Sometimes I need to put on a sweater and a long sleeve shirt. And that's pretty, that's pretty chilly. You guys, it can get down to 60, 50, 40 at night. Sometimes it even snows. Now, when I was a trucker, I was two weeks straight. I was going back and forth between Detroit and Twin City, Michigan, uh, Twin City, Minnesota, which I think is uh, St. Paul and something else. I can't remember the others, other of the Twin Cities, but it was negative 50 with a wind chill at the coldest and negative 20 at the warmest for two weeks straight. And I remember thinking that negative 50 with a wind chill, oh, they're just being dramatic. No, that's really real and it's really cold. It is not something I was used to. I walked back to my, uh, my truck after, after showering in a truck stop and my hair was wet because I'm from Tucson. I don't think about this. My hair was wet and I walked back to my truck less than a quarter of a mile in negative 50. I got back to my truck and my hair was frozen solid. It wasn't like so frozen that it was shattered when I touched it, but it took a while for it to thaw out. It was one of the weirder experiences I've had in my life. It's cold. You know, what's interesting about that though is after two weeks of that, I, uh, I dipped down, I, I got a delivery down into Iowa. I went down into Iowa and it was like 26 degrees above zero. And I remember I got out of the truck and I was wearing a t-shirt and I was like, this is fine. And I walked around for like an hour in a t-shirt and I was fine. You become acclimated to those, that cold weather pretty quickly, or at least you feel like you do. After negative 20, 20 degrees feels very nice. Parking is a very important thing. We need to be able to have quick egress from the situation if at all possible. In fact, any place you park, even if it's just at the Panda Express for lunch, you need to park in a way that you can get out of there quickly, okay? If you get stuck, you become a problem. You lost it after living in Sacramento. Oh yeah, now we're now you're a little sun baby, I'm sure. That's that's the way that uh, that's the way that it goes. And that's probably probably for the best, right? I love the cold and I love snow, but uh, man, I love I love visiting the snow and then skiing in it and snowboarding in it and then making a snowman, throwing snowballs at someone, and then coming home to warmth. I don't like getting stuck in it for six months out of the year. That was less fun. All right. Talked about parking. Yes. Always park so that you can make quick egress. Uphill, upwind is always what they're going to recommend. Yes. Always wear your uh, reflective vests on scenes. Um, it's just a good idea. We need to be as visible as possible. And unfortunately, people do get hit and killed. It happened in San Diego. Within the last 10 years, EMT stopped at a, at a wreck. This was not the ALS ambulance that was responding to the accident. It was just a benign accident on the highway. No one was really hurt. The uh, BLS ambulance pulled over to the side, was trying to get out to help people, and uh, someone clipped one of the EMTs, hit him, killed him instantly. But when the, EM, when the ambulance showed up, they didn't transport the patients from the vehicle that had like you know minor back pain and things like that. They transported the EMT, who was essentially dead on scene from traumatic blunt arrest. And they took him to the hospital, and they worked him for 45 minutes, but there was nothing they could do, unfortunately. It's a very realistic concern. Safe patient movements assessed, packaged, and moved to the ambulance for transport. There's a really great video of, well, great, you might consider it great. Maybe you guys saw that video a few months ago of uh, a helicopter trying to extract a patient that was stuck on a, on a trail. And normally they have to tie down the, uh, the gurney, as the scoop stretcher as they're lifting it up, but they didn't tie it down because they were in a hurry. So what happens? They start lifting the patient up, the patient gets stuck in the downwash and they just start spinning, 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 spinning like a top. It was crazy. Thankfully, the patient did not get seriously injured from that. They were, the patient was a little dizzy, but they were okay. That could have gone a lot worse if the patient was having a severe blood pressure issue, right? But thankfully, that's not what was going on. They managed to be okay. There's also a great video. I'll try to find it during lunch today. I'll show you guys afterwards of paramedics trying to extract someone from the Grand Canyon by using a horse to carry a gurney. The horse starts freaking out, bucking, kicking, jumping around, and ends up flinging the gurney off of it with the patient still strapped to it. Safe patient movement is something that we need to consider. 
secure everything. Also, another one is just not losing the patient's stuff, okay? It's happened to me before. You're transporting 10 patients a day, and then at the end of the day, you discover someone's ID sitting on the back of your gurney that you forgot to hand over to the hospital. That sucks. It sucks even worse if you're the patient. Try not to do it. Try to drop it off at the hospital. Hopefully, the patient's still there. 